As all eyes are on the Middle East tonight, thousands of miles away, this is the reality in parts of Ukraine right now. That explosion was today, and it's just a small glimpse of what people have been facing across the country, with Ukrainian leaders saying if they don't get more help fast, they're going to lose the war. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. It feels like right now there is war on so many horizons. We're going to talk about what's happening in the Middle East in just a moment. But buried behind those headlines is the very bleak reality of Ukraine right now. That situation there has gone from grim to desperate. And a warning, what you're about to see, is disturbing. But this was just taken today where a Russian attack killed at least 17 people when missiles rained down on the city of Cherniev. Over 60 people, including kids, were hurt. It's the kind of attack that are overwhelming Ukrainian leaders. And now President Vladimir Zelensky is calling out, well, he's calling out everyone for what he sees as a blatant double standard. Our allies cannot provide us with this or that weapon, or they cannot be in Ukraine with this or that force. Because that would be perceived as if Ukraine is engaging NATO in the war. Israel is not a NATO country. The NATO allies, including NATO countries, have been defending Israel. They showed the Iranian forces that Israel was not alone. And this is a lesson. Now, in an interview this week with NBC News, Zelensky's presidential advisor put forth this very pointed question, quote, how does the civilian population of Ukraine differ than the civilian population of Israel? Well, for weeks, months, Ukraine has been asking for new military support, specifically air defense systems. And without that support, they say they will not be able to stop Russian forces from advancing. Now, aid to Ukraine has been held up in Congress for months, but it looks like we may finally see a vote this weekend. NBC News international affairs analyst and former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, joins us now. Uh, Am ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Just, I guess, level with us here. Is, Ukrainian, is Ukraine right now losing this war? Well, before I answer that question, I just want to thank you for showing what you just did from Chernihiv. Uh, 17 people were killed there. That was a terrorist attack. 17 more people were killed there than were killed in Israel. We all saw that horrendous terrorist attack from the Iranians, but it was stopped because they had the weapons to stop it. Yet what you're showing on your screen right now happens every single day in Ukraine. And so it is time that Congress, several months, September, they've been debating this. It is time for them to pass this assistance, because if they don't, not only will Ukraine begin to lose on the battlefront, they're losing incrementally, to, to, to answer your specific question. They've lost a few key cities, but everybody I talked to, including somebody who was just on the front line yesterday, says that in a matter of weeks, they will begin to lose um, uh, much more territory on the battlefront, but they will also continue to lose civilians, just as you are showing, without our missile defense assistance now. Uh, civilians, uh, morale, I, I've been reading reports of artillery groups with no artillery to, to, to use in their fight against uh, Russia. Zelensky has been drawing comparisons between the aid they're getting versus Israel. You, you made a similar comparison uh, here. His, uh, his take right now is that Israel is not NATO and they got allied defense. D does he have a point there or is that just an unfair comparison? I think rather than saying, you know, they're doing that, give us that, we should be inspired by how well our air defenses worked in combating and thwarting the Iranian attack and aspire to do exactly the same in Ukraine. It's the same technology. Uh, we're the same country. Uh, we can do this with other allies in the NATO uh, alliance. Uh, it just takes the will to provide those kinds of weapons and the assistance that the Congress has to approve. And when we're talking about those weapons, I mean, we, we did see U.S. military jets in the sky above uh, possibly Jordan, Israel, that whole area, shooting down some of these drones. If that doesn't happen in Ukraine, but Ukraine gets some of the air defense systems that they are requesting, would that turn the tide of the war? 
Well, I would say two things. One, nobody knows for sure. I want to be clear about that. Uh, two, colleagues I talk to in Kiev, uh, literally uh, just uh, almost every day, believe absolutely so. And they're very specific about what they think they need. They're not asking for Americans to be involved. Americans were involved in the defense of Israel. They're not asking for that. All they're asking for are weapon systems, and three kinds in particular. One, missile defenses to protect their civilians against these kinds of attacks that you're showing right now. Two, air, aircraft, F-16 specifically. By the way, they're not even asking them from us. They're asking them from the NATO alliance. They think that that will help them deter the attacks that they are getting from Russian aircraft that are shooting into their country. And three, they want long-range missile systems uh, from us. That would be, that's a system called the ATACOMS that would allow them to attack military targets uh, deeper into occupied territory, particularly in the occupied uh, region of Crimea. They think if they had those three weapon systems, that would turn the tide in favor of Ukraine. That's what they're asking for. Is that what's in the current bill, this current aid package that's being discussed uh, this weekend? Is what we're possibly going to send if that's voted on? Is that going to be enough? That's a great question. We actually don't know the details of what that money would buy. And I hope as we have a debate this week, um, people should ask, members of Congress should ask, what they are buying, what what this money will go for, and, and get more response from the Biden administration about what they intend to do. Uh, because I think the American people have a right to know, will this money just go to continue the stalemate, or will this money go to provide new kinds of systems, like the ones I just outlined, that would help change the balance of power on the battlefield. And most certainly, I lean towards the latter. But right now, that's ambiguous. It's not exactly clear. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Sure. Thanks for having me. Turning back to what's been going on in the Middle East after that first Iranian attack on Israeli soil, we now have a better picture of the weapons that they use, which include some of the same kind of drones that we've been seeing Russia use in their full-scale invasion of Ukraine. So let's take a, a quick look at Iran's arsenal. From the moment the first launches of Iranian killer drones and missiles were detected, a new era of warfare in the sky. All told, Iran launching more than 300 of their signature drones, as well as crews and ballistic missiles, flying towards Israel in retaliation for the Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. Here's some of what we know about Iran's weaponry. At first came the waves of the Iranian-made Shahed 136 drone, a drone that has also been used extensively by Russia against Ukraine since 2022. The drone has a max speed of 115 miles an hour, meaning it took hours to cross the well over 600 mile distance between Israel and Iran and making easy targets for fighter jets scrambled to intercept. The IDF says 170 of those drones were destroyed with U.S. forces shooting down 80 of them. The IDF also saying it took down 30 of what's known as the Pave cruise missile that can reach 559 miles per hour. As for the more advanced ballistic missiles, the IDF reporting around 120 of the Imad and Khyber Shekan ballistic missiles were launched by Iran, both able to fly over 1,000 miles, with the Imad missiles able to carry a warhead of about 1,500 pounds. Those were also almost entirely intercepted or failed at launch, but as many as five are believed to have hit Israeli territory, causing minor damage. As for how many more missiles and drones remain in Iran's stockpiles, exact numbers are still unknown, but Iran is believed to have the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East, possibly 3,000 or more. While their close allies, Hezbollah, is estimated to have more than 100,000 missiles and rockets that could further test any air defense system in the region. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, there is still high, dangerously high tension between Israel and Iran, with world leaders extremely worried that escalations there could spill over and turn this into an even bigger conflict across that region. Foreign ministers of Brittany, uh, Britain and Germany even met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today, who is also all of them pushing for restraint. But Netanyahu basically shot that down, saying that while he appreciates the support, Israel will make its own decisions on how to retaliate against Iran. Iran is not exactly staying quiet on any of this. The president saying today that even the tiniest attack by Israel will bring a harsh response. NBC's Raf Sanchez has more.
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today meeting with the foreign ministers of both Britain and Germany. Those European officials arriving with a consistent message that they stand by Israel, they support its right to self-defense against Iran, but they do not want to see Israel escalate this situation any further. We don't know exactly what was said in those meetings, but whatever it was, it left British Foreign Secretary David Cameron with the very clear impression that Israel plans to retaliate. Take a listen. The situation is very concerning. It's right to show solidarity with Israel. Uh, it's right to have made our views clear about what should happen next, but it's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. We hope they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this uh, as possible, and in a way that, as I said yesterday, is, is smart as well as tough. Now, the U.S., the U.K. do not want to see Israel retaliate in a way that leads to a full-blown regional war with Iran. Over the last 24 hours or so, we've had a couple of dangerous reminders of what that could look like. Israel assassinated two senior commanders with Hezbollah, the powerful Iranian-backed militant group in southern Lebanon. Today, Hezbollah responding with missiles of its own into northern Israel, injuring around 14 soldiers. So that remains a very, very delicate situation up in the north. In Gaza, after months of pressure from the U.S. and other countries, Israel has opened up one of its southern ports to get more aid in. That is a welcome development from the perspective of humanitarian groups as Gaza hangs really on the brink of famine. But the consistent message from the U.N. and others is that there needs to be a full ceasefire if they are going to get the necessary food and the necessary aid to the people who need it. Back to you. And some breaking news tonight. A volcano in Indonesia has erupted several times, triggering a tsunami alert and forcing hundreds to evacuate. Mount Rung has erupted at least five times in the last 24 hours, according to local officials. And the fear is now that part of that volcano could collapse into the sea and cause a tsunami, which is exactly what happened 153 years ago. NBC News Chief Meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. Bill, uh, this is right along the ring of fire. Those images are incredible. As far as volcanic activity goes, how explosive are we talking here? It looks like it's AI generated, right? I mean, it, it, right. It, the pictures that we've seen at night with the lava and the clouds and the lightning is crazy. So this is where the ring of fire is. This area has had about a couple thousand minor earthquakes, you know, that preluded what happened with this uh, volcanic eruptions. And this is Monado. This is one of the largest cities. About half a million people live there. Not that far from the eruption, but the ash cloud did stay north of them. And this island itself, it only sticks out about 750 meters out of the sea, which is roughly about a half a mile up. And what the concern concerned with is that some of the it could collapse into the ocean and then when all the rock and stuff hits the water it makes a tsunami a localized one and that's what happened with Krakatoa a long time ago too so that's our part of the issues and but just these pictures and one thing that you notice all those flashes that is lightning it's kind of a little different than the lightning you get in thunderstorms it's like static electricity so if you ever like put socks on and rubbed your feet on a rug and then go and touch a piece of metal that's similar to what's going on it's all fragments wow. of the ash in the atmosphere and there was over 4,000 lightning strikes during the peak of this eruption um, and this did go up thousands of feet. We don't know exactly how high yet, Gotti, into the atmosphere. This one is, you know, not a super volcanic eruption, but a very strong one. Now, I remember with, with Tonga, there were some possibilities that this was going to affect the global climate. Any possibilities here as well? Yeah, Tonga it was measurable, but it wasn't major. So let me get into this a little bit and show you. So we have a little animation here. So this is our volcano example. So we get that plume, the ash plume going up, and that is mostly ash and sulfur dioxide. Well, if it goes up high enough into the stratosphere, like above, even like up there where the jets fly, it gets into the jet stream and it doesn't sink to the ground. It just kind of floats up there. And it's mm. the sulfur dioxide can actually take the sun's rays and then deflect them. And this has happened in the past. This isn't like anything that's, you know, you know, theoretical. I mean, when we had Krakatoa, this is the Earth's temperature. It dipped, and it's happened numerous times with other strong volcanoes over the last 150 years. El Chacon, we had a dip, then Pinatubo, we had a dip. So we'll wait and see just how much sulfur dioxide got in the atmosphere. The scientists will figure that out. Uh, but yeah, there could possibly be at least a minor cooling. It won't mask global warming and, you know, the warming of our planet, but there may be a small blip. Fascinating lesson on volcanoes there, Bill. Thanks so much.
Meanwhile, here in the United States, the threat of severe weather continues tonight and into tomorrow while much of the Midwest recovers from tornadoes. More than two dozen tornadoes have been record, uh, reported across several states this week alone, and the worst of the destruction happened in places like Iowa and Kansas. NBC's Maggie Vespa has more. Scotty, things have clearly cleared up here in Ann Arbor, but this is after that latest system roared through earlier today, and it was really intense. I want to show you a video that I shot kind of through our dashboard, uh, through our windshield as we were driving near Detroit. You can see we're on an interstate, and we're going like five miles per hour because the rain suddenly just started sheeting. Really intense, severe winds started blowing through. You can see people are basically at a crawl. Brake lights are on. Semis are pulled over with their hazards on. That storm just came blowing through. That lasted about five to ten minutes, and it was really scary there for a few minutes. The severe threat, our scientists are telling us, lasting into the kind of late evening hours in parts of like Pennsylvania and the Ohio River Valley that could produce more damaging winds and tornadoes. So we're keeping an eye on that. But as you know, I mean, this is the latest chapter in a really violent week of weather. Right now, our weather team tells us more than two dozen tornadoes were reported Monday and Tuesday across at least four states, kind of in the Great Plains into the Midwest, like as far as far east, I should say, as Iowa. Ten of those two dozen plus tornadoes have been confirmed at this point. A lot of the reports came, for instance, in Iowa. Our team was on the ground today in a little rural town called New London. Shaq Brewster was there and he saw, among other things, a house that was completely destroyed. Emergency management officials were out there surveying the damage along with the National Weather Service. Inside that house, he tells us, an 85-year-old woman basically uh, lived through the storm. She completely survived. She's unharmed. But again, her house was totally destroyed. Earlier today, neighbors were kind of walking with her, helping her wrap her mind around what happened. And local school children were there helping her sift through the rubble. And again, this severe threat, Gotti, is far from over. I'll send it back to you. Maggie, thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, the clock is ticking for the man accused of murdering those college students in Idaho. He has until today to give a more concrete alibi or that defense goes out the window. We're going to tell you what went down today in court. And it was a busy, busy day in Washington, D.C., including that whole impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. There's a lot to break down tonight, and our Capitol Hill team is standing by to do just that. And later this hour, what happens when an elephant escapes and roams the streets of Montana? Well, understandably, it's a, it's a circus. It's a story you don't want to miss. Stay tuned. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Elephant walking down the road. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening at West that we're following right now. The FAA has lifted a temporary ground stop for all Alaska Airlines flights. Now, this was caused by a computer issue. The Seattle-based company was trying to upgrade their system that measures weight and balance, and then things got messed up. It's unclear how many flights were affected. And the LAPD says a group of teens and young men might be behind a series of flash robberies. They've been rushing into shops, stealing whatever they can, and then taking off on bikes. And that crew includes about 10 to 20 suspects who were likely attending high schools near the targeted stores. Now check out this wild crash scene involving two cars and a fire truck that slammed into a house. Now this happened earlier today in Stockton, California. Those inside the fire truck were okay, but two people from the other cars were hurt and taken to the hospital. One of them is in critical condition right now, and the owner of the home was apparently across the street getting coffee when the accident happened. An investigation into the cause of that crash is ongoing. Where was Brian Koberger the night four University of Idaho students were murdered in November of 2022? That is the question. His lawyers may have just answered kind of for months his lawyers have been saying that at the time of the murders he was just driving around solo like he often does at night according to them but the judge essentially said that's not enough where was he where's the proof is there anyone that can back up his claims meanwhile a lawyer for one of the victim's family says they are frustrated by the endless delays in this case every family wants to have a resolution to a crime like this any 
victim's family wants to have a resolution date. And so every time there's a hearing that's scheduled or something that comes up that's an issue that that delays the potential trial date, that affects them. When there's delays, it you get your hopes up and then it you come back down again. And you know, and every time it does that, it it affects them them uh, emotionally. Now to that alibi, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Adrian Broaddus, because Adrian, it looks like right in front of you, straight out of the printer, we've got a new filing. They have responded to this uh, request for that alibi. It's filled with highlighting. Yeah. <laughs> what do they say? So we just read through this, and I just want to break it down for you a little bit here, Gotti. Essentially, attorneys for Brian Kohlberger are saying that before school started back up, he was an avid runner and hiker and would be outside a lot. But when school resumed and a lot of people were back on campus, his running and hiking decreased, but his late night drives increased. Now, according to this document, uh, attorneys are saying that Koberger intends to offer testimony from an expert who will show that his mobile device was not near the crime scene, not near the area at the time of the killing. And here's what we highlighted, this part that says, and thus... It could not be the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway near that cannabis shop. Nevertheless, if this information listed here is not enough for the judge, it's going to be that much harder, Gotti, for Brian Kohlberger's defense team because they're going to have to rebut everything the prosecution presents. And we already know investigators have DNA evidence linked to Mr. Kohlberger, as well as other digital evidence. So this defense attorney will have to find some sort of rebuttal if this alibi isn't sufficient enough. So that now goes before the judge. The judge was pretty adamant at the beginning. Look, you got to be specific or this is going to get tossed out. It, it sounds like we could hear testimony from a cell phone expert as a part of this. That's what they're saying here, that Koberger intends to offer this testimony from this expert. And this person will be able to show that his cell phone was not in the area. By contrast, prosecutors and investigators have said the night of the crime, when, the, when they believe those four students were killed, that Koberger's cell phone was off. And they're also asking for the prosecutors to provide additional information. And I think that's key because... The defense can't later say, oh, we have this additional witness or we have this video that will show our client was nowhere near the area. It has to be today was a deadline day. Right. And, and if I remember correctly, it was the cell phone was on. The cell phone was on around the time this happened. The cell phone goes off. And a little bit later, the cell phone comes back on. So it's going to be really interesting to hear what this uh, what the defense calls to the stand here. And, and hopefully we'll have answers very soon. Absolutely. Adrian, thanks so much for joining us. Sure thing. And Republican lawmakers in Arizona once again rejected Democrats' attempts to stop that 1864 near-total abortion ban from going into effect. Earlier today, Democrats tried requesting an immediate vote on a bill that would repeal the Civil War era ban, but that was squashed. Let's take a quick listen to what was going on there on the floor. We are the representatives of the people, and the people want this repealed. It is time to have a vote. It is time to repeal this abhorrent 1864 abortion ban. And I would ask everyone in this chamber to respect the fact that some of us believe that abortion is in fact the murder of children. Now, all this comes one week after the state Supreme Court upheld the law, leading to an uproar across the country to strike it down. Now, if that law takes effect, it would ban abortions from the moment of conception, except in the case of a mother's life in danger. NBC News Washington correspondent Yamish Alcinder has more. Democrats in the Arizona State House tried to bring up a bill that would repeal this 1864 law that bans nearly all abortions in the state. But there was a big hurdle. The House Speaker, a Republican, opposed repealing the law. Democrats had been trying to convince at least two Republicans in the House to go against their leader to get the votes needed to move forward with that repeal. But that effort failed because Democrats were only able to get one Republican to vote with them. Now, sources tell NBC News that Democrats plan to keep bringing up the bill to repeal. But the bottom line here is this fate of this repeal bill for now is sealed. 
After talking to Democratic aides and abortion rights activists in Arizona today, my sense is that most Republicans do not want to defy their leadership and they do not want to go against anti-abortion activists who literally cheered when the bill to repeal the abortion ban failed earlier. Now, meanwhile, those in favor of expanding abortion access are worried about the future. This law from 160 years ago could take effect by the end of June. Now, interestingly, former President Donald Trump has urged Arizona lawmakers to act as fast as possible to adjust the state's abortion policy. But that could really only impact some Republicans and how they see this issue. This could also all change after the November election because there is an effort for a ballot initiative to enshrine abortion rights into the Arizona state constitution. This could also, of course, as with that ballot initiative, be left to voters. Yamish, thank you. Hawaii's attorney general just dropped a massive report on those deadly wildfires last summer. And this is over a 250 pages of details about that day. And it breaks down a comprehensive timeline of exactly what happened, how many units were responding. It also gets into some details on how fast that grassland fire turned into a catastrophic disaster. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins us again today. Uh, Steve, this AG report coming literally a day after Maui fire dropped their report and yet still know who is responsible, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, this is just, just to be clear, this is almost an extremely detailed timeline of the events that took place. As you mentioned, 250 pages going into excruciating detail, almost minute to minute of before the fire happened, what happens during the fire, and then the response after and the reaction to that, of course, outlined all in this report. Is it anything that we didn't know before? You could say yes and no. I mean, no, based on the facts of the case that we've already known since, you know, eight months ago when this fire started. There was nothing literally new. What's new is how stark in relief that we're seeing it. It is a much clearer impression. And then based on that, inferences are made based on the communications that you can see, because they're also in the report as well. You can see some of the text messages that come from the mayor to officials who are handling the case. And some of the breakdown in that communication gives you a clearer picture that there was some level of confusion about a fire of this magnitude striking a town that small and their reaction to it being obfuscated by all they have to do in a very quick time frame and they were slow to do it. Meanwhile, I mean, residents I spoke to are a little bit, I wouldn't say upset, but I would say disappointed that, as you mentioned, none of this covers the who, the what, the where, the why, right? It doesn't give you how this fire started, it doesn't tell you who is responsible, and we're not going to get those answers for a long time. I spoke to Tier uh, Lawrence. I believe she's been on the right. show before. Yeah. She's, she's great about sort of being this de facto community liaison. Here's what she told me about kind of her disappointment with all of these reports coming out this week and not really saying much more than we have already know. Listen to this. We were hoping that we would get more information in terms of the actual cause that led up to the fire. I think, you know, if you're from Lahaina and from Maui, we pretty much know what the cause was. Um, and we've always known the issues for years, and we've been asking the county for and the state for, for well over a decade um, to fix a lot of the problems that led up to this catastrophe. So this is phase one. We're not going to probably get answers that would satisfy community members until maybe phase three. The question becomes, why would the attorney general release this in phases mm -hmm. when you just have a basic report that's a timeline? The attorney general dressed this and said, essentially, you don't want to just sit on information that you have. You want people to start interpreting the information that you do have. Phase one, phase three, yes. what happens in phase two? Phase two is about, so phase one, if phase one is the timeline, phase two is sort of more detailed explanation on the reaction to the fire. Phase three would then be giving recommendations. We don't expect phase two for another couple of months, maybe late summer, maybe even six months down the line. And hopefully that lines up with the ATF investigation, which will give us a cause in this fire. Now, uh, Steve, you have so much experience covering yeah. some catastrophic fires. Paradise, for example. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at this. Uh, cause aside, is there anything in this report that seems particularly egregious, uh, given the chaos and the confusion that was going on? Or, I mean, disasters are disasters. Anything that is an automatic, obvious, like this is, uh, this is, uh, horrible. Disastrous. And I, and I think that's the point of them sort of detailing 
the minute to minute of the fire, it's because they have never obviously seen anything mm -hmm. like this. I mean, few fires ever reached the wind speed, the level of destruction, the magnitude of destruction, the level of displacement of communication that you have to have to sort of get people uh, the information that they need. They are just not equipped. And who is? Who would be equipped to deal with this fire? I think that's part of the point. It's the same thing that we saw in Paradise as well. That doesn't mean, though, there shouldn't be systems that were in place based Based on the warnings that they were getting from the National Weather Service to tell them that something more needed to be done ahead of this fire. So I think it cuts both ways, but it's incredibly difficult when you're talking about a fire of this magnitude. Got to hopefully lessons learned all around. Steve, thanks so much. Thanks. And today, a Boeing whistleblower told Congress why he thinks certain planes could break apart in midair. We've got the details from that testimony coming up. But first, you got to see this. This guy is a fox, and he climbed up onto a bright red $250,000 Ferrari, but leaving behind more than paw prints. That's right, he's, he's like pooping right there on the car's back window. It was all caught on the owner's door security camera in London. He was in for a surprise the next morning. He posted it on TikTok, good-natured chap, which is what you're seeing right now. Oh, my gosh, what a sly little pooper. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. We are 100 days away from the Summer Olympics in Paris. More on the countdown in just a minute. But first, let's take a quick look around the world. The United Arab Emirates is recovering from yesterday's very wet storms. Despite being a very dry desert there, this is the rainiest it has been there in 75 years. And highways in Dubai are just swamped. Dubai International Airport, the world's busiest for international travel, was flooded, delaying and canceling flights. And about four inches of rain hit in just 12 hours. Hours. That's usually what the country gets in an entire year. And lawmakers in Georgia came to blows inside of parliament this week. Literally, the leader of the ruling party is seen standing at the podium there when all of a sudden he's cold cocked by the, uh, in the face by the member of the opposition party there. That led to an even bigger brawl among the lawmakers. This happened as the ruling party appeared all set to advance a bill that is similar to the one in neighboring Russia that they've used there to silence critics. And former Myanmar President Aung San, Aung San Suu Kyi was moved from prison to house arrest. Now, military government officials say the change was all an effort to protect her and elderly prisoners during the heat wave. She's been serving a 27-year sentence on a variety of convictions, including bribery. She was arrested in 2021 when the military overthrew her elected government. Guys, get ready because the Paris Olympics are just 100 days away, 100 days until over 10,000 athletes compete in the biggest sporting event of the year. And get this, 100 is the number to watch because it's been 100 years since Paris hosted the Olympics. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung breaks down those Olympic numbers for us. Hey, Brian. Well, hey, Gotti, you know I'm a huge fan of numbers, so let's contextualize the Olympics by the numbers. We're 100 days out, and it's been 100 years since the last time Paris hosted. It was exactly in 1924 that they last hosted. Prior to that, they did host in 1900, so this is their third time hosting the Olympics. They're going to have over 3 million square feet of Olympic Village covering the, vi the uh, buildings and also the venues and the walkways. But at the Athletes Restaurant, fun fact, 3,200 seats will be there, which they joke is going to be the largest restaurant restaurant in the world. Maybe no reservation needed if you're an athlete there, at least. It's going to be very secure as well. Uh, 45,000 police personnel will be present to make sure that everyone is safe during the course of the Olympics. And then for Americans that are trying to travel to Paris to see the games, $767 is the cost of a round trip flight. That is according to Hopper. That's actually cheaper on average than this time last year. But for those that are also have to tack on the cost of going to the events, it might cost you a little bit. Depends on what you're going to see. $53 or less for many event tickets. They say about half the tickets will be priced at that price point. The more popular events, of course, will be a little bit more expensive. Now, what about the games themselves? 10,500 athletes representing over 200 uh, committees around the world. They will be present there competing in 32 sports. We did lose a few sports compared to the last Olympics. No more karate, softball, uh, baseball, but we did add breakdancing, which I'm pretty excited to watch. There's going to be 329 medal events. And then the last stat here is six sides. That's going to be on the medal because a hexagon shape represents France. They call France l'hexagon because it kind of looks like a hexagon.
depends on how you look at it. <laughs> Lastly here, records to watch eight gold medals in women's swimming. That's what we're going to be watching for from Katie Ledecky. If she gets her eighth gold medal, that'll tie Jenny Thompson for the most decorated women's swimmer. Three minutes and 26 seconds in the 1500 meter is the record. We'll see if an American can beat that. That's about two and a half minutes faster than uh, the fastest mile that I can do. And then the gymnastics, one more medal is what we're looking for from Simone Biles for her to become the most decorated uh, U.S. gymnast in history. Uh, and then also six gold medals in basketball. That's what we're going to be looking for from Diana Taurasi if she makes the roster and then competes. If she does get six gold medals uh, or her sixth gold medal, she would become the most decorated team athlete in Olympic history. So a lot of really interesting threads to watch here. But of course, as we get to the games, go team USA. Back to you, Gotti. Fingers crossed. Brian Chung, thanks. And NBC is going to be bringing you all that Olympics coverage in just 100 days, so stay tuned. And before we go, one of the wildest stories you have heard in a while. An elephant escapes from the circus and was loose in Montana. you got to see this one to believe it. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. A very busy day on Capitol Hill that we're going to break down in just a moment. But first, here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Sources tell NBC News the Justice Department has agreed to pay $100 million to 100 victims of Larry Nasser, who is the former National Women's Gymnastics Team doctor. Now, that huge payout comes after the DOJ says the FBI failed to take the star athlete's report seriously. The settlement has not been finalized yet and was first reported by the Wall Street Journal. But the plaintiffs include former Olympic gymnasts Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, and Michaela Maroney. They all testified at a 2021 Senate hearing about the FBI's failures. And we are learning new details about the health and final months of the infamous Unabomber before he killed himself in prison last June. An autopsy report we just got says Ted Kaczynski was depressed and had a rectal cancer in March 2021. The report also says that Kaczynski used a shoelace to hang himself. And soon, there could be a picket line on Sesame Street, or at least its New York offices. Writers at Sesame Street Workshop have voted unanimously to go on strike, and they're prepared to walk out if a tentative deal is not reached by Friday when the current contract expires. The new contract proposal includes things like annual raises and improvements to residuals. And the four people accused in the murder and kidnapping of two Kansas women made their first court appearance this morning. Arrest affidavits say all of uh, say that one of the suspects is a victim's grandmother who was involved in a custody dispute with her. And all four suspects have been charged with first degree murder and are being held currently without bond. And today, the NBA banned Tor Toronto Raptors forward John T. Porter for life. Porter allegedly bet on games, passed on information to gamblers, and claimed he was sick to influence a wager, all of which is very much against league rules. The NBA launched an investigation into Porter in late March after sportsbooks noticed irregular betting in two Raptors games. So far, we haven't been able to reach Porter for comment. Now, remember when we used to read about impeachment in history books as this once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing, like it was serious business? At least that's how it seemed back when Nixon and Clinton faced it, but now it seems like it's more of a an airing of grievances kind of thing on Capitol Hill, because today the Senate took up the impeachment of Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas after the House impeached him back in February. And the two articles of impeachment that he faced were willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law and breach of public trust. And the whole thing failed in the Democratic-controlled Senate, but not without quite the show. And NBC uh, correspondent David Noriega is here on set with us to break this down. David, I imagine somewhere, or maybe in a lot of places, some political science professors are, like, taking their textbooks and being like, OK, this changes everything. This is going to be used as a political weapon from here on out. Uh, what, what are the implications here? So each side here is accusing the other of setting a bad precedent. The Democrats say the Republicans set a bad precedent by pursuing what they say is a clearly politically motivated and legally baseless impeachment. The Republicans say the Democrats set a bad precedent by shooting it down so quickly. The proceedings took about three hours. There was no opportunity to hear evidence, et cetera. Um, you know, I think when we, what we can say for sure is that impeachment is happening more frequently. And given how much it's gotten wrapped up in all the political theater around it, a lot of people are worried that we're going to be seeing a lot more of it and that the 
importance of it, the heaviness, as you pointed out, is, uh, has sort of been taken out of the proceedings and might be even more so moving forward. And with these articles, were they policy disagreements? Were they airing of grievances? What was going on? Yeah, so the substance of the articles of impeachment had to do with Mayorkas's handling of the border. I actually recently sat down with Mayorkas and interviewed him specifically about the situation on the border, and we sort of talked again about, about the substance of this. So, for example, one of the things that he was impeached for was uh, allegedly not following the law by not detaining every migrant that crosses the border, because the law says technically every migrant shall be detained until the conclusion of their immigration proceedings. That isn't happening, but it, that's not new to the Biden administration. That also happened in the Trump administration. It happened in the Obama administration. Uh, Mayorkas's main position is that the situation on the border is due to structural problems with the immigration system, which is outdated and broken, and that Congress needs to fix it. It cannot be meaningfully addressed without Congress. When I was speaking to him, I said, look, you're still the secretary of DHS. It's still your job, even if it's outside of your hands largely. It's still your job to deal with it. And then I followed up with this question. Take a look. Republicans in Congress are impeaching you because they say you are not doing that job. Why not do more? We're doing everything that we can with the resources that we have. We have removed or returned more people um, this fiscal year, um, uh, more than any prior administration in a complete year. And so we are enforcing the law. The accusation is that we're not. That's just unequivocally false. So, look, once again, kind of separating the politics and the substance of this, that's Mayorkas's position. If you look at the last administration, agree or not, they had a very clear message to voters on this issue, and they had an agenda that they pursued very aggressively. A lot of the time it didn't work. A lot of the time it got shot down by the courts, but that didn't stop them from trying. That, I think, is one of the main differences that we're seeing between the last administration and this one, and that is, politically speaking, the vulnerability that Republicans are attacking with this impeachment. Fascinating interview. Did you get any gleaning or any sense that... I don't know, we could see some executive action anytime soon? That's what everybody on the immigration beat right now is waiting for. He told me, you know, he said, which executive action should I do, right? Is it remain in Mexico? Because that's not going to work, because Mexico has said that they're not going to agree to something like that. Also, because so many of the migrants arriving now are coming from not Mexico or Central America, but from other parts of the world, it's unlikely we'd be able to return tens of thousands of Chinese or Indian migrants to Mexico. The Mexican government just wouldn't agree with that. At the same time, we've seen some signals from Biden himself, right, from Mayorkas's boss, saying that he is seriously considering trying something. Again, I think that has a lot more to do with the politics of this than with the actual substance, because I think it's true. There is no magic wand executive action solution that will provide a quick fix to this problem. It is far too deep and far too structural. And I'm sure you did not tell him what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not my job. <laughs> yeah. David Noriega, thanks so much for joining us. You got it. Also on the Hill today, the whistleblowers from Boeing, one of them claiming that efforts to flag safety issues were met with either silence or threats. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has more. Today, two hearings with Boeing in the crosshairs. Boeing is at a moment of reckoning. As a former FAA engineer, a former Boeing engineer, and a current engineer all told senators Boeing is putting production and profits ahead of safety. Effectively, they are putting out defective airplanes. Engineer Sam Salapur, who told us Boeing 787 Dreamliner has a potentially fatal flaw. Would you put your family on a 787 right now? I, right now, I would not. Today, telling senators he warned Boeing the 787's fuselage could break apart. I raised concerns internally. I was sidelined. I was told to shut up. But Boeing is pushing back hard, insisting it does not tolerate retaliation. And after more than 4.2 million flights, 13 years of service, and extensive stress testing, it has zero evidence of airframe fatigue. Today, the CEO of United Airlines, with 70 Dreamliners, said he's not concerned. I am totally confident. The 787 is a safe airplane. In the hearing room, relatives of the 346 people who died in two MAX 8 crashes overseas demanding change at Boeing. There was no accountability. Not a single person from Boeing went to jail. Also today, a panel of outside experts commissioned by the Senate reporting back on Boeing's culture. They hear safety is our number one priority. But what they see is that that's only true as long as your production milestones are met. Boeing's culture and safety management needs drastic improvement. 
Boeing says it will act on the panel's findings, but it insists safety already comes first. Tom Costello, thanks so much. And still to come, countdown to Paris. We are 100 days away from the Summer Olympics, and we're breaking down the games by the numbers with our own Brian Chung. He's coming up next, so stay tuned. And now for the future of everything. You ever see an ambulance or a fire truck drive down a crowded street and think, uh... How are they going to save lives in all this traffic? Well, now AI may be coming to the rescue. C2 Smarter, a research group, is using street sensors and an AI-based traffic prediction system to help fire trucks navigate New York City streets faster. Others at Light are using AI to pin down traffic light changes that will help first responder vehicles in San Jose, Seattle, and some other cities. Meanwhile, fast is not always better. A TikTok video is going viral after a Tesla Cybertruck driver showed how the accelerator pedal, that cover, came loose and pinned the pedal down, making the truck accelerate on its own. Cybertruck buyers have reportedly been alerted to delivery de delays, and we've reached out to Tesla for a response, but so far we haven't heard back. And speaking of Tesla, should the big boss man get a raise, and by raise, we mean $56 billion. Uh, this isn't out of nowhere. This is the second time Tesla's board is asking shareholders to approve this multi-billion dollar pay package for CEO Elon Musk. And this is months after a Delaware judge threw the first proposal out, claiming the deal was deeply flawed in part because Musk, not Tesla's board, has too much say in controlling the company, including his compensation. Tesla is also looking to move the company's incorporation from Delaware to Texas. And that is a big deal since more than 60 percent of Fortune 500 companies are incorporated in Delaware. Plus, this is all coming on the heels of Tesla laying off 10% of its workforce. Wall Street Journal business columnist and author of Power Play, Tesla, Elon Musk, and the bet of the century, Tim Higgins joins us now. Tim, thanks so much for being with us. Tesla announcing layoffs just days ago. Uh, is this just is bad timing to request given the billionaire boss a raise, or is this, is this just how this works? It's, it's definitely a bad look, to say the least. It's probably part of something uh, broader, though, that we see going on with Tesla and Elon Musk. You have to remember, for the last few months, uh, both have been under incredible s uh, scrutiny and criticism um, for the way the performance of the company and for the suggestion that Elon Musk is distracted with all of his other endeavors, whether it's X, the social media platform, or SpaceX, or just being Elon Musk. And some investors are concerned he's not putting in the time that needs to be done. While deliveries, those sales of cars have fallen in the first quarter, uh, one of the worst quarters for the company they had since 2020, uh, really surprising Wall Street and really uh, increasing the uncertainty among some investors. So it's a, one of many things going on to try to right the ship. We also have Elon out there talking about Tesla's future, how he wants to have uh, robot cars and how he sees this as a robot company, not an EV company as we have known it for the last 20 years. Uh, what's with the ability of a judge to deny a pay raise like what happened in the first proposal? How, how is that possible? This, this comes out of a lawsuit that a, an investor in Tesla brought uh, about that pay package. Uh, this uh, opened it up for for the judge to review it. She felt that uh, the board was not uh, essentially at arm's length from Elon, that Elon was in there calling the shots. You have to remember the board of Tesla has Elon's brother on it, a number of people who have close business relationships with Elon. And when you got into the records and the testimony of the case, it really looked to some people that Elon was making some of the decisions as if he was negotiating with himself. And essentially the judge said this was deeply flawed process. Now, after that, you saw Tesla, you saw Elon Musk say, hey, we're pulling out of, of Delaware uh, and there's going to be a lot of other companies that follow us. Has that happened? Well, it's not as simple as just doing that. Uh, but it's definitely put a spotlight on the, the state and its role in corporate governance. Uh, clearly, Elon uh, thinks that Texas would perhaps uh, be uh, more uh, friendly to the way he likes to run things. Uh, that is yet to be determined. Uh, this new pay package is, is, is still uncertain. Uh, there's a lot of questions about it, and uh, some think that there'll probably be more litigation going forward. Uh, litigation going forward. Everything's bigger in Texas. We'll see if bonuses are as well. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. And before we go, what is something you'd never, ever expect to see walking down the street? NBC News correspondent Sam Brock shares a story of how an elephant 
just decided to take a stroll in Montana. Elephant. <laughs> There's a certain quality of disbelief. Uh 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 uh. That comes with seeing things that don't belong in everyday life. Oh my God. And for residents of Butte, Montana Tuesday, oh, like Matea Smith, who was driving with her husband, an elephant strolling down the street definitely fit the bill. He was like, oh my gosh, there's an elephant. And I kind of was joking with him and I thought it was in the parking lot. Then he was like, no, there's an elephant. So I looked up and I was like, oh, there is an elephant in the road. The manager of the Civic Center, where the Jordan World Circus was staging, Confirming to NBC affiliate KECI, the giant animal apparently got spooked by the sound of a truck backfiring during a bath and bolted. So set the scene for me, right? You see the elephant coming down the street, and then how long after are her handlers also pursuing Viola? I'd say 30 seconds behind her, but the problem is, is that an elephant's much faster than a human. So you see, <laughs> you see the elephant get into the road, and by the time she's over by the casino, her handlers are just running out as fast as they can. Once Viola popped up on this gas station security camera. My coworker from here pointed out, uh, there's an elephant. Started jumping up and down, pointing out the window. And then trotted right by the casino. All bets were off. Witnesses say the whole circus-like scene lasted around 20 minutes before the powerful pachyderm was safely recaptured. Jordan World Circus did not respond to NBC News' request for comment, but their website showed a scheduled stop in Butte the same day as Viola's escape. Now it's a tall tale for a town of 35,000, accustomed to seeing plenty of animals. Typically you see moose and coyotes, um, lots of bear. But nothing quite like this. I will never forget this. It's not every day you get to see an elephant just wander through your hometown. <laughs> Uh, looks like he's doing a little multitasking there because he's an elephant. <laughs> All right, that does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.